Hello, I'm Helena Chance from Bucks New University and I've come here to Lacey Green today to meet Rosemary who is an expert in the history of lace making and lace makers and we're also very lucky to have Rosemary as our consultant on the Woodlanders Lives and Landscapes project. Woodlanders Lives, as we call it, is one of the 18 projects that makes up the wonderful landscape partnership scheme Chalk Cherries and Chairs which is funded by the National Heritage Lottery Fund. Chalk Cherries and Chairs is involving local people in conserving the landscape, the wildlife and the heritage of the Chilterns. And Woodlanders Lives and Landscapes, our volunteers are looking at the lives of the people who lived in the villages and woods and who made their livings in some of the key craft industries, um, those home-based industries in the Chilterns. So let's now um, meet Rosemary. Hello, my name is Rosemary Mortham and I'm the Secretary of the Lacey Green and Lucy Row History Society. For some years now we've been looking at the lives of the villagers and recording the details before they get lost. So obviously one of the things which was quite popular in our villages was lace making. My family moved to the village in 1949 and at that time there were still a few old ladies who had been taught to make lace for a living when they were younger. My mother was absolutely fascinated by their work and the beautiful results. So when we children were old enough to be left, she took herself off to the Wickham College where she learned to make lace from the uh, very well-known and somewhat formidable lace-making teacher, Miss Dawson, who had lived in Spain and had once been my mother's maths teacher. Here's my mother making lace and showing a little girl from the village how to do it as well, Nicola Richards. Whilst we were at classes, my mother and I met a lady called Pamela Nottingham, who was from Marlow. Pam was a craft teacher and she became a very well-known lace teacher and wrote a number of instructional books on the subject. This is Pam here, she's at a lace making day in Marlow, where her family came from, and this is one of her books, The Technique of Bobbin Lace. You see Pam's hands, and she was, as this is pretty accomplished lace making, take my word for it. Pam has inscribed it for me, so I'm quite proud of it. The local villagers were actually very helpful towards us and they, they tried to give us things that, that they thought we might find useful. Our church verger, Mr Barefoot, brought me a whole sack full of bobbins. And this is the last of them now. Most of them were put into use. Unfortunately, some of them had woodworm and had to be destroyed. But there we are, we think of Mr Barefoot. The girls in the village mostly had been taught by their mothers uh, at home. But a generation before would have been taught probably at a lace school. And there were some quite big lace schools in the larger villages around. This is a famous photograph of the lace school at Stoken Church. You can see there's quite a lot of children, girls, learning to make lace. And this is one at Cranfield in Bedfordshire, where they were trying to resurrect the art of making lace, which they did at the beginning of the 20th century but it was not successful. In our village, we haven't been able to find out where the lace school was, though we know there was one, and we think it may have been behind the black horse, because in the 1851 census, there's a lady said to be a, lace te uh, said to be a school teacher, but there was no school, so she must have been teaching something. Another thing that we were given, very lucky to be given, is this wonderful South Bucks pillow, still completely original. It was given to us by a friend of my mother's um, and it was her mother-in-law's and was kept in the attic. She told us that we should never let anybody know where it had come from as it was traditional to burn the bobbins and pillows of lace workers when they died. Uh, this is also her bobbin horse which was used to support the work. When you sat down you had the pillow in front of you and the horse just to hold the back of it. So South Bucks bobbins were almost all made from wood. Here's some examples of South Bucks bobbins. They were really 
quite fancy, but there are more fancy ones, as I'll show you in a minute. Uh, the ones made around High Wycombe often had inla inlaid bits of wood, um, because obviously they had the ability to do that in this area. And some of them have metal pieces on them, which were put, would have been put on by the wheelwrights. They were made, usually for sweethearts or mothers, by the Bodgers in the woods, and they just used odd bits of wood that they had. Here's one of our group members, father, Reg Tilbury. He's making, or turning, a chair leg, but he could have used the same technique to turn a bobbin. And here's some Bodgers in the woods. So bobbins are obviously there to hold the thread. They've got a little bit at the end, which is like a baby cotton reel. Here's one here, if you can see it. Uh, they're wound always clockwise around the head and there's a hitch to stop them from unwinding. Most importantly, they were to keep the work clean. That was very difficult in the old cottages that they had. And the end piece, uh, which is bulbous, was to provide weight to give a good tension to the work. Right, now you will probably be more familiar with the bobbins of North Bucks. They are prettier because they have beads on the end and often they have words inscribed on them. There's one here that says Mary Ann and one that says Mary Hall Twyford, 1840. So we do know exactly when that was made. The beads are what we call square cuts. They would have been made by the blacksmiths and they were struck. Um, to, to, so the outline of them is square and at the end was a, a special bead. The most special one is called a serpent. It would have been like a green wiggly bit, which was meant to keep the evil spirits off your pillow. My mother was fortunate enough to be given a lot of the bone bobbins, which are the most desirable, by a relative in Vista. This is the type of thing. They are different. One's got metal, one's been coloured pink, One's got writing, and they've all got very pretty beads on them, original old beads. She keeps these in a bobbin box which my father made. My father was trained as a marquetry cutter in High Wycombe, so there's the little decorative bit that's on the top of his box. But most people just had a country-made box like this one, and the hinges on this were just nails, as you can see at the top here, and then just a little hook to hold it closed. The bobbins uh, were wound with a thread and in this part of the world it was a linen thread uh, because that's stronger and they had to come from abroad the linen threads mostly. Here's a skein of linen thread that's how they would originally have come not on a reel. The skein would have been put onto this shaped piece here and then the handle is turned and the bobbin goes round and you can wind the thread on. It does make it a little bit more quick. Oh, here's, here's a box actually of um, the sort of linen threads that we would have used. At the back here, we've just got some examples of work which my mother and I did when we were learning. So I might come back to one or two of those in a moment. To get, get your equipment, you had to use a lace dealer, and the nearest one to us was the housekeeper at Hampton House. So this is Hampton House, uh, which is just up the road from us, the next village. She would have acquired the orders from the wealthy people who visited, um, and then she got the thread and the prickings, the pattern that is, and gave them to the person who was going to make it. And then of course they had to return it to her, she paid, but also she took a profit herself. In the High Street in High Wycombe, there was a shop called the Bobbin Castle. It was at the Eastern Street end of the High Street, just before you turn up to the station. That's the best I could do for a picture of it. But people could go there and get their necessities if they wanted, it was just a bit more, a bit further. The man did still, he still took orders. This is the sort of lace pricking that they would have had. This is one of the oldest. It's pricked onto vellum, which is calf skin. Uh, so it's very hard wearing. And the, bit, the piece is sewn onto the end 
were to help you to attach it to your round pillow so you could just work round and round. There were various different sorts of lace made here. This is a pricking for Buckinghamshire lace, quite a complicated one. And this is another Buckinghamshire lace which became popular after Prince Albert died. It would have been a black lace. They are slightly different in their patterns. And here's a Bedfordshire design. I'll tell you a bit more about that in a minute. Buckinghamshire lace could be very difficult to make and requires a large number of bobbins. This is a pillow which I actually am, am working on. There are quite a few bobbins, but that is nothing compared with the ones that might have been used, say, in 1850, when they were making really wide pieces of lace. So this is Buck's Lace. It's characterised usually, the best of the Buck's Lace, by floral motifs at the top. And then you've got a net in the middle and the ground at the bottom, uh, the foot at the bottom, sorry, the bit that you would attach it to the work. Here's some pieces of Buck's Lace. You can see here the floral motifs quite clearly, and the net, and the foot here. And this is a collar that I made. Uh, again, it can be quite difficult to produce a pricking of a shape like that, because box lace, the ground is actually at 33 degrees, rather than other laces that have ground at 90 or 45. So really, you need to be almost a mathematician like Miss Dawson was to work out the patterns. And here's an old lady in the village. She's got a pretty large number of bobbins. <laughs> Quite impressive, that. And this is a sampler which I made, which shows the different sort of effects that you could acquire in Buck's Lace. Yes, so you would use it, as, as is shown here, in pairs. So actually always you're working with four bobbins. You're not working with all of these bobbins at once, just four. And you're making your stitches, which I'm going to say a bit about later on. Moving on from there, although lace bucks could be very ornamental and take a lot of work, towards the end, uh, like after 1850 really, um, it began to become simpler so that people could work faster and produce more. Here are some samples. It was fairly typical to have samples that you could send to the lady who might like to order your lace. These were made at Walter's Ash Farm, which is just down the road from here. You see, some of them are quite short. They are not Buck's Lace. This is Torshon, called Torshon, and this one. And these one, this is called Bedfordshire Lace. Here's some more Bedfordshire Lace here. You can see, actually, that the thread is getting a good deal more coarse. First of all, moderately coarse, and then really very coarse on this doily here. So here's, again, some different types of lace. Uh, Bedfordshire here, a torsion, and this is an interesting one in lacy green particularly, towards the very end, not only was it coarse, but they started to introduce colours uh, because they thought that would might make it more saleable. I don't know unfortunately that it actually did. This is torsion, and it would have been used along a mantelpiece to decorate a mantelpiece. Another speciality in lacy green that I don't have any examples of was gold lace. Of course, that would have been very valuable because it was genuine gold thread. None was left in the cottages. Every last scrap was gathered up and sent back. Lace has always has a foot, a head and a ground. It's the ground part that makes Buck's Lace what it is. It looks like a net. The foot was used to attach it, as with this one, attach it to the work. And the head was mostly the more decorative bit. After Prince Albert died, they also made black lace. Here's one of Queen Victoria's dresses, which has got a deep scallop of black lace along the bottom. And in this village, when lace making no longer was profitable, they did change to doing timbre bead work, which is this sort of thing here. We've got just the beads showing on this, um, it's actually a cushion cover. But I still would like to know a bit more about tambour beading and I hope that the Woodlanders project will be able to throw more light on it. Now although lace looks very complicated, in fact it consists mainly of two stitches. This is a beginner's practice piece. It shows the two stitches. So at the top we've got whole stitch or cloth stitch. 
which does look exactly like cloth with some some of the pieces going down and some across. So here we have the white pair were going across and the red ones were coming down. Then I changed to the other stitch which is called half stitch which is a more open and fancy effect. From those two you can make almost everything. And sometimes there was a thick piece in which is called a gimp which you'll see here a thicker thread running through to outline the pattern. The workers Cottage workers worked mainly from their door steps. They liked to be outside, they got more fresh air, more light. The light was very important. There was not enough light in the cottages. So here's a Mrs. Mary Janes. She was um, still working into the 20th century. She has an extremely wide piece of lace on her pillow and she lived in Loosley Row. If you had to work inside, you could use something like this. It's a used to magnify a candle. So you would fill the actual flask part with water, the candle behind it, the light would be magnified and fall onto your pillow. A more popular type of this, um, which I don't have an example of, has actually one candle and several flasks. So several lace makers could work around it at the same time. So, because candles were expensive. So that made one candle go a long way. If you're cold outside, you could use one of these, it's called a dicky pot. It's like a small chamber pot and you would fill it with hot embers from the fire and then you put it under your skirts, I'm afraid to say. It must have been quite a fire risk, <laughs> but it would keep you warm at least. <laughs> and I've been told that the ladies who use these smell absolutely appalling. <laughs> Okay, so we're very lucky today to have a friend from down in Water's Ash, just the next village to here, called Alex Adkins. She's been learning lace for six years, but she is definitely very talented at it. Today she's brought along for us a very complicated piece of Buck's Lace. As you'll see from her pillow, large number of bobbins, just as I was talking about before. Beautiful results, all done on a Buck's Net ground. So Alex now is making a Bucks mat. This is very advanced stuff, believe me. Um, you can clearly see the gimp, which is outlining the patterns here. And this is where she's actually got to with her work. So the, the pins are just there to hold the thing in place temporarily. Lots of people think that the pins are there to work it round. This is not the case. No. There may look like an awful lot of bobbins here. There are an awful lot of bobbins, but she will only be working with four at a time. And those four can be used to make a whole stitch or a half stitch. There are one or two exceptions to that. Mm. Um, but ba basically those two stitches make all the pattern. So here we have a little piece which we call a tally but it's actually just a little bit of whole stitch or looks like cloth, just ordinary woven it does. cloth. Yes. Yes. And then we've got little holes here that helps to make it look more light and airy. Yes. Yeah, do you agree with that? Yes. And the net here, the net ground, this is a buck's ground. This is really difficult to work out this pattern. I don't know who did this, but because it's done at 33 degrees, as I said earlier, every time you turn, you've got to change the angle of the background. So somebody very clever worked out this pattern. They did indeed. And in fact, it was designed by Jane Lewis. Oh, right. Um, who teaches yes. in Chesham. I can see that. Mm. So now you can see how the um, thread was wound around the head and we can let it out. Could you let it out a bit? Mm. So if it, if it wants to be longer, we can make it longer. And it doesn't unwind. Or we can do it up again using a pin. And now if you do a stitch for us, Alex. Mm -hmm. well, so there's just those four, then she'll move on to the next. She'll take two from one side and two from the four that she's been working with and make another stitch. Notice that because there are so many, she's having to hold them together in bunches. Some people use like large safety pins to do this. They do, yes. yes. I find this more convenient because you can work from both sides. Yeah, of that's the right. The bundle. Yeah. And as I was saying, I like working with the South Bucks bobbins because they actually tumble over each other. You don't have to pick them up physically from the pillow. But with the North Bucks, because it's got the beads, you've got to physically pick them up and move them to where you want them to be. And then you put a pin, but that pin won't stay there. 
It only stays there for a little while to make sure when you tug on it, you don't pull it out of position. Alex is working with silver pins, but I've always worked with brass pins. It must be something that doesn't actually corrode in the work because it can take quite a while to do it. And I'm going to do some reverse lacing because I've missed a hole. Ah, yes. Nobody ever knows when you've made a mistake because when you're undoing it, it looks just as clever <laughs> as when you're not <laughs> undoing it. That's we better. all have this problem. There we are, that's right. Yeah. But you've got to know what the original, what the final design will look like. And then you can tell that you have made a little error. Thank you, Alex. That's absolutely wonderful. I'm really impressed oh, with this. You're, you're welcome. <laughs> I've enjoyed it. <laughs> so now we're getting a shot of two local lace makers sitting outside this beautiful little cottage, the oldest cottage in the village, we do believe, from the late 1600s. Um, and uh, that's how they would have been years ago. And so they're sitting here doing their lace. And Sarah has got a very simple torsion pattern on here. And Alex has still got her box pattern. This is absolutely typical of how they would have been. I'm sure they enjoyed the company. They could have a chat whilst they were sitting here. Rosemary, it's been a real pleasure to hear more about lace and lace makers. Thank you so much. And it's been lovely to have you, Helen. And it is so nice to be able to pass on some of the things that I've learnt in my lifetime to the younger generation. That's so important. So I hope to see you again soon. I hope so too. Bye bye. Bye. If you'd like to know more about the Lacey Green and Loosley Row History Group, or if you'd like to know more about the Risborough Lace Group, if you'd like to see examples of lace, you can see them in the County Museum in Aylesbury. And if you'd like to know more about the Chalk Cherries and Shares Landscape Scheme and the Woodlanders Project, you'll find all the contact details, websites and other details at the end.